has millions in a trust. I need major repairs to the house. We got kids living here in unsafe conditions. But no control over her money. I've been told I have brain damage, that I am incapable of handling my finances. Is she being protected? She can't manage a checkbook, but she can manage four children. Or exploited. It's her damn money. She has the right to do what she wants to do with it. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready. Take care of you. baby is born is usually one of joy and elation for parents but when Sarah was born her parents were said to be terrified due to frightening circumstances which led them to sue the hospital take a look when I was born in 1985 I ended up getting lodged in the birth canal and that cut off my oxygen so the doctor decided to do a high forceps delivery and when he did that he crushed the left side of my skull my parents decided to sue the hospital for malpractice suit and they ended up settling for a 5.1 million dollar settlement around age two my parents divorced and my mom had sole custody the lawsuit that they won for me was put into a guardianship because i was a minor and my mom oversaw the money until she passed away when i was 15. when i turned 18 my dad explained to me that the next step was for the guardianship to become a trust and so he had set up an appointment with lawyers that he would become the trustee i had no attorney had no representation and of course i did the natural thing which was to trust my dad after my dad took over things definitely rapidly went downhill well sarah says she had no idea exactly how far downhill things went until she started snooping around and uncovered sneaky and questionable behaviors I started digging through bank records and something was drastically wrong here. My dad completely mismanaged my money. He had a new truck every year, dental work done, plane tickets to go see his girlfriend. I immediately had him dismissed as the guardian and trustee and asked my cousin to become my trustee. Initially, it seemed like she was helping me, but I realized she was sneaking her way into control. She never gave me cash out of the account. This has always been about control and getting paid. They're making a paycheck off of it. I called a lawyer and I eventually agreed to sign everything over into a voluntary property guardianship, also known as a conservatorship and it's supposed to have no end date whatsoever. I was also told that it would cut the blurring of the lines between business and family. I wanted things to be easier. <laughs> the control over the money was actually tighter. Things that people take for granted, like taking out of their savings to fix things on their house, I have to get permission from a court to do that. I wanted to get a horse last year the guardian at the time told me that i was trying to demand things from them it was just a disaster and then they said we'll get you the horse but you have to account for every penny with everything that has been done the people that did it to me were my family they took advantage of the situation it was wrong it was wrong dr phil what can i do how do i get out of this Well, Sarah, it's good to meet you. Good to meet you. Now, I understand that this was put into um, a trust, conservatorship, whatever the instrument was when you were a minor. I, I get that. But then what was the theory under which it wasn't turned over to you when you were no longer a minor? I think part of it was protection for myself. For what reason? Because I was young. 
At 18, that is a lot of money for an 18-year-old sure. to have. Sure. Um, but you're not 18 now. Correct. I hate to bring that up. Uh, okay. But you're not 18. Was there some theory that you had some kind of brain damage from what happened when you were born? Yes. As things have progressed, I have repeatedly been told that I am mentally disabled, that I have brain damage, that I am in no way, shape, or form capable of handling my finances. Are you mentally disabled? No. Do you have four children? I do. You have custody of the children? Correct. And you live independently? I do. You run your household? I do. And raise four children? I do. Okay. Um, but yet, somebody's telling you what to do with your money. That's, that's, see, see, here's my... The reason I'm questioning this is because we're in America. And in America, depriving anyone of their liberties, whether it's taking someone off the street and putting them in jail or taking away from them the right to make decisions in their own life, is a very high standard. That's not something that should easily be done. We have the right to be stupid. Right. Like if, if, if you wanted to take your money at 30 and give it all to the Cat Preservation Society, we would probably, a lot of us here would disagree with that, but if it's your money, it's your right to do that. But you don't have that right. No, I do not. And, and sometimes that's good. I mean, it, but, but still, it should be your right. Correct. And you don't have that right. You say that you're under an instrument that's suffocating. It is. Mm -hmm. Now, you say that the judge has to approve everything given the instrument. Correct. Okay, like you live in a house and you say the house needs repair? Correct. Like what kind of repairs? It needs ceiling repairs, wall repairs, floor repairs. You need money to fix a ceiling that's caving in. Correct. My laundry room wall, the trim around my laundry room wall is molding and rotting off the wall. And have you told them this? I have. For example, when I told them about the ceiling, they said, well, let's make sure that the roof is not leaking. They replaced my roof and told me we will be back after the roof replacement to fix the ceiling. Okay. And they still have not dealt with the ceiling. Okay. Well, now, there was an award of $5 million. Now, whose money is that? That's mine. That's your money? Correct. And correct me if I'm wrong, is it your understanding that the trust, the conservatorship, whatever it's called in, in your state, is for your benefit. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's yes. what I'm saying. The, the, the theory, the spirit of this is, is to be for your benefit. Yes. Not to make it harder for you, but to make things better for you. Correct. And, and if that involves protecting you from yourself, if you were going to do something... Like, let's say you were getting catfished by somebody from Nigeria, then they would step in and protect you. Well, we're not going to let you send money to somebody you've never met. That might be something reasonable, but they're supposed to make life easier for you, not harder. Correct. Okay. And you don't think that's the way it's going? Absolutely not. You say that you've asked permission to buy a horse and that you were told that that was burdening the conservatorship. Correct. But you, you got the horse. Eventually, yes. But it was difficult. It was very difficult. It was almost a year-long process. And so your question is, why do I not have control of my money? And you were tested back in 2017 to see whether or not you were impaired and you did need somebody to help you think, help you make decisions, help you manage things? There were three people on the examining committee. Two of the examining committee both agreed that I should be able to handle things on my own. The third had reservations. But you were evaluated. I was. Okay, and I've seen that evaluation, and it said you were functioning normally. Yes. Well, we're going to meet uh, Sarah's husband, Robert, uh, he's here, and he says he feels like they're being watched by the FBI because of Sarah's conservatorship. We'll talk about that 
and meet Robert after the break. The lawyer for the trust company insinuates that I'm just there to try and get Sarah's money. I am not a gold digger. Tomorrow. He says he has 200 pieces of irrefutable evidence that you are cheating on him, sometimes in your own house. You can hear it in the uh, audio recording. No, you can hear it in the audio recording. You call her fat, nasty, and you don't understand why she doesn't respect you. She could stop a car on the street at random and get treated better than you're treating her. That's tomorrow, then on Monday. Every single wall has a hole in it. You have sewer flies. This is our shower. I'll get, like, sludge on my hands. Why are you living this way? This is absolutely criminal. That's been controlling. I have to limit the budget that I spend on groceries. Major repairs to the house cannot happen. I need the holes in the walls fixed. I need my ceiling fixed. I need the subfloor fixed under the bathroom. I need the mold gone out of my laundry room. I can't do any of that because they have control. I deserve this money. It's my money. I'm here with Sarah, who received a $5.1 million settlement at age four after her doctor committed malpractice by injuring her head when he used forceps during her birth. Instead of receiving it at 18, when she reached the age of majority, uh, she claims family members played various roles in trying to control the money and her. Now, today, Sarah is under the control of an irrevocable conservatorship and her husband, Robert, says it's controlling every step of their daily life. Well, I met Sarah in 2010 because I was called to come over and do a paranormal investigation on her house. She had some activity going on that kind of startled her and wanted it gone. The ghost left, but I stayed. After dating her for about six months, she finally explained to me where her money was coming from with this property guardianship and all. Sarah and I got married on November 3rd, 2017. Sarah can't do what she wants to do with her own money. We sit down, we look at when the bills are due, and we see what we can actually get paid on time. Others, we may have to put off till the next week. Right now, our bathroom ceiling is literally falling down, and I'm sorry, I don't think our kids should be living like that. The lawyer for the trust company insinuates that I'm just there to try and get Sarah's money. I am not a gold digger. I'm a sound engineer, I drive for a carpool service, and I'm also a paranormal investigator. If we have a repair, then we wait for the judge. So while we're waiting for the judge to approve, we got kids living here in unsafe and unsanitary conditions, and I don't like it. I feel it's just an absolute load of crap that she has to go through this. But at the end of the day, her happiness is the only thing that matters to me. Robert, good to meet you. Thanks for being here. Nice to meet you. You think they think you're in this because she has a settlement? Correct. Okay. Well, you got married in 2017? Yes, sir. So this is the long con. They you're, think it anyways. You, you think they think you're five years into this. Um, so uh, if there was no settlement at all, if there was no money over here at all, would you two be able to maintain this house and your family and go on? I think so. I mean, we did the best that we could. When you have talked to them, the, the, the current people that control this, the current entity that controls this, have you asked to dissolve it completely? Yes. And as soon as that subject gets brought up, I am quickly told by the bank and the powers that be, that that is completely impossible, that I signed a contract voluntarily that erases that possibility. Mm -hmm. This is an excerpt of stipulated petition for voluntary guardianship of the property. It was signed on April 19, 2010. It says both have had the opportunity to consult with their counsel have voluntarily and willingly entered into the stipulated petition, and neither has been promised anything outside the terms of the agreement. 
Okay. Did you have your own counsel? I did. And was your counsel there when you signed it? They were. And what did they tell you? That this was the best way to protect myself as well as the finances. Protect you how? Say I was to get into a car accident right. and someone was to sue me. This would protect the finances that were involved in this guardianship from being attacked through a lawsuit. Right, because it would be in a trust instead of in your name. So right. a trust can't have a wreck. So if you had a wreck, the money would be in the trust and they couldn't sue the trust because they didn't have the wreck, they'd sue you. Right. Okay, I, I get that, but you don't control the trust. I do not. I was sold because I was mentally incompetent. I was unable to handle the finances. And if you're not impaired, then the spirit of the trust is, is violated, right? Correct. Well, what does Sarah's attorney have to say about this? I mean, clearly there's a conservatorship here, so we're going to hear from him next. And later, we had Sarah evaluated ourselves, and we're going to reveal those results when we come back. You started to push back quite a bit, right? I have. Do you think there's a money motive here? Absolutely, I do. Have a normal life. We can't be spontaneous and say we wanted to go out for our anniversary. We can't do that because we don't have the money. When my boys graduate from high school, I can't say, you know what, let's take them to Disney. We can't just sit there and say, hey, baby, let's go to Vegas. We can't do it. We have to petition for it. I cannot take the kids to the mall and get everything on their Christmas list. It's not going to happen. It's literally laughable. Well, I'm here with Sarah and her husband, Robert, who say they want to fight Sarah's conservatorship that's been in place since 2010 uh, to protect her $5.1 million. Now, it's been in place for a long time, but the most recent iteration was in 2010. Now, I said we wanted to hear from Sarah's attorney. What did this individual have to say? So we spoke with Sarah's attorney, who declined to participate because he told my producing team that he didn't want his name broadcast to protect his privacy while he continues to work on Sarah's case because he may be involved in things going forward. Uh, if there is some contesting of this conservatorship or whatever. Now, here's what he had to say, and this is an excerpt. The Guardian's actions have been odd and unusual. The Guardian's legal duty is to treat the beneficiary with fairness and to give her as much freedom as possible. Everyone involved in the managing of Sarah's trust is making money off of it. This is a costly process. The biggest hope Sarah has is that even irrevocable contracts can be amended. Now, this is your attorney, and he says everybody involved in this is making money off the trust. They are. Um, so having this go away or dissolving it or having it challenged, um, if somebody is making money off this, they would not have an incentive to have it go away. Correct. Do you think there's a money motive here? Absolutely, I do. Okay. Absolutely, I do. Um, any Anytime there's something that could be simply handled in office, um, a misunderstanding of how things are supposed to be done, be it from myself, be it from the guardian, be it from anybody involved, instead of having basically a roundtable discussion, it's, well, let's file a petition and get a hearing on this, mm -hmm. which, of course, racks up more attorney's fees, racks up more court costs. Mm -hmm. um, that was a pretty complex sentence that you just used. You know, the average newspaper is written at the fifth grade reading level, and... Um, that was a pretty sophisticated verbalization you just gave there, which, just saying. 
That's just what I um, <laughs> Now, the bank that's currently handling your, your trust wants to resign. You've started to push back quite a bit, right? I have. When you really started to push, they said, well, we quit. And that thrilled me to a point. Um, they have not officially signed the paperwork to resign. So if the current bank is quitting, and this is a good time to move for modification, I mean, your lawyer thinks this, if we're going to amend this in some way, this would be the time to do it, right? Yes. Now, Sarah's question for me is, do I think she needs to be in a conservatorship? So I send her to be tested objectively to determine her level of competency, and I'm going to reveal the results when we come back. I'll be interviewing you, and in that interview, the questions I ask will tell me a lot about how you think. I'll be evaluating your eye contact, your concentration, the way you carry yourself. You want to know what Dr. Phil and I think? I do. Sarah, she's my human calculator. A few years ago, I got a full mental exam from a neurologist, and I found no brain damage. I manage four kids, a husband, four dogs, a horse, but I always am able to keep it organized. When my parents met her, they thought she was super smart and brilliant. They cannot tell me that I am mentally incapable of handling myself and my finances, ever. Well, Sarah and her husband, Robert, say that a strict conservatorship is preventing them from accessing what Sarah owns, her own money. Now, you think, well, why doesn't she just go out and get a job and get the money she needs to do what she wants to do? If, in fact, you get a job, that money has to go to the conservatorship, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, she told my producer she wanted a professional opinion of her mental capabilities, so we did just that. Dr. Charles Sophie, child and family psychiatrist and a member of the Dr. Phil Advisory Board. Uh, agreed to sit down and do a thorough evaluation with Sarah to objectively determine her level of competency. I'm Dr. Sophie. Sarah, how nice are you to doing? Meet you. So what we'll be doing is I'll be interviewing you, and in that interview, the questions I ask will tell me a lot about how you think. I'll be evaluating your eye contact, your concentration, the way you're dressed, the way you carry yourself, your speech. And then when I'm done those questions, we'll move to a more standardized test on the iPad. That'll tell me a little bit more about you. And so you are okay with us delving deeply into you? Absolutely. And you want these answers? I do. You want to know what Dr. Phil and I think? I do. And you're willing to take some tests? I am. Okay, so we're going to begin this testing. Do you know today's date? It is December 5th, 2021. Right. Where are you at right now? I'm in Los Angeles. And where do you live? In Pensacola, Florida. And who's the president? Joe Biden. Who was the last president? Donald Trump. I'm going to ask you to remember three things, and then I'll ask you later on. Okay. Lamp, table, the number four. What are they? Lamp, table, and four. Good. When you're thinking, do you ever lose track of your thoughts? No. And you have no problem getting dressed in the morning? No. How would you describe your mood most of the time to me? I'm usually in a good mood. If you found a letter on the ground that was stamped and somebody was going to mail it, what would you do with it? I'd put it in the mailbox for him and... You wouldn't open it? No. That's not my business. If you're at a stoplight and it's red, nobody's around, would you wait or go? I would just wait it out. Do you remember those three things? Lamp, table, and four. Very good. So now we're going to do a test here on the iPad. Okay. We're done. Thank you. Thank you. So I met with Sarah, I've done my testing, I have my results. I'm super excited to find out the results of my test. The obvious next step would be to petition the courts to dismiss the guardianship. I'm going to review this all with Dr. Phil, put it together in a report, and then we'll be sharing it with everyone. Well, Dr. Sophie, thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> so you sat down with Sarah and um, you evaluated her interviewed her what were your clinical impressions well i found her to be awake alert oriented her memory everything intact reality testing she doesn't hallucinate she's not suicidal she's got good judgment as we see by the questions she has good recall 
She has good recent remote and immediate memory. So I didn't see anything clinically wrong. Mm -hmm. She did have a history of postpartum depression, which you had during the signing of this. But anything other than that, no. Mm -hmm. Very well intact. Um, and you did some psychometric testing, so there was an objective measure, not just your opinion. Right. And how did she do in that regard? Very, very well. You're smart. In terms of IQ, and I understand there are lots of different kinds of IQ, but uh, we generally break that down in terms of uh, superior, bright, normal, normal, dull, normal, and on down. Uh, did she have anything that caused you concern that was below normal for her? No, not at all. Her IQ was 99, and 70 is the cutoff for you know, average, anything above 70 is normal. Uh -huh. The higher you go, the more closer to genius you get. Anything around 90 to 100 is pretty significantly good. And she was very good, 99, almost 100. And she had some subsets where she was 109. Right. And, she and they was... were the verbal things that you and I have noticed, that her verbal skills are yeah. much better than anything. <sighs> and she has four children, and she has Absolutely. custody of that. No one right. has ever challenged her custody no, of not that. Not even going through a divorce, correct? So. So the same state that is supporting the fact that she doesn't have the ability to manage her own affairs is supporting the fact that she has the ability to manage four children. Right. So now, yeah, it's crazy. So she can't manage a checkbook, but she can manage four children. Right. <laughs> gotcha. Um, clear enough? Thank you. We call them as we see them. We're going to hear from an estate planning expert, attorney I have great confidence in. She's going to explain why she feels it's important uh, for Sarah to do certain things when we come back. Tomorrow. He says he has 200 pieces of irrefutable evidence that you are cheating on him, sometimes in your own house. You can hear it in the uh, audio recording. No, so you can hear it in the audio recording. You call her fat, nasty, and you don't understand why she doesn't respect you. She could stop a car on the street at random and get treated better than you're treating her. That's tomorrow, then on Monday. Every single wall has a hole in it. You have sewer flies. This is our shower. I'll get, like, sludge on my hands. Why are you living this way? This is absolutely criminal. That's Monday. Closed captioning provided. Legally, it's all confusing to me. We have lawyers, but I don't understand what they're talking about. I don't know if I could get out of a guardianship tomorrow if I wanted to. We could request a dismissal, but we know that it will immediately be met with opposition. Sarah and her lawyer had suggested making me the trustee over her trust. I don't want to do that. We've already got people saying I'm trying to get her money. The only thing I know is that my property guardianship says that I am not allowed to manage my own finances. I'd like to add to the conversation uh, attorney and good friend of mine and the shows, Ann Margaret Carosa, who specializes in elder care and estate planning. She's here to discuss Sarah's case and what she believes the next steps should be. So, Ann Margaret, thank you so thank much you. for being here. Thanks. Um, <laughs> now, I, I, I've got some questions first before you weigh in on this. Things change, people evolve, and conservatorships can be created that fit at one phase of a person's life and not at another phase of a person's life, correct? Yes. And they can be put together for one purpose, uh, and then circumstances can change where the spirit or the purpose with which something was created becomes obsolete. When I looked at this voluntary guardianship petition and the settlement agreement, there is no such thing in any state of the United States as a voluntary, irrevocable guardianship. Those two words shouldn't be in the same paragraph. When you voluntarily enter into a guardianship or a conservatorship, it should be easier 
not harder for you to get out of it. So I think that the folks who had you sign that kept showing you irrevocable guardianship and perhaps that caused you not to fight as hard as you should have. So we know that the standard nationwide for having a conservatorship or a guardianship is whether or not a person is capable of making sound decisions. Now that should be the same standard for you to back out of this arrangement, but I can tell you as a, a practical matter that you need to go a little bit beyond that. You need to show them that not only are you capable of making sound financial decisions, but that you actually are making sound financial decisions. Well, I would submit it's none of their damn business. <laughs> it's her damn money. She has the right to do what she wants to do with it. If she wants to go blow through it, that's her money. It's not their decision. If, if it was a just conservatorship, I get it. I think she should challenge the right of them to have an opinion at all. If it's a valid instrument, then they have the vote. But it seems to me if it was set up because she's incompetent, she's not incompetent. So there are two parts here. One is the legislative side, and I served for 14 years as a New York State legislator and was involved in writing guardianship laws, so we studied them all across the United States. And whether we call it a conservatorship or a guardianship, it's supposed to be of the least restrictive means available. Uh, that is clearly not the situation you're dealing in. And I am not suggesting not to, you know, raise bloody blank, but as a practical matter, we want to get you out of this darn thing first, and then you have recourse. The laws of all 50 states say that a guardian has personal responsibility. If they were not watching the hen house, and uh, the financial advisory firm was raping the guardianship assets and fees, uh, they're gonna have to pay you. And I wanna be very clear, we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever that any of the guardians here were doing anything improper in this whatsoever. I'm just saying that question should be asked, but I'm not suggesting they have, not saying they have, don't know if they have, but I'd certainly find out. Definitely. So you have our opinion. You asked for it. You now have it. Thank you. Okay? All right. And Margaret, thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next, we're going to meet a man who wants to know if putting his wife of 16 years under a conservatorship is a good idea. We'll hear why now this summer by going to drphil.com because summer is no fun when you're hungry. We've been talking this hour about the seriousness of conservatorships and how difficult they are to get out of. But sometimes when a loved one's mental health is severely declining and there is no way out, it could be an answer. Now, when Mark last appeared on this stage, he explained how his wife, Lori, squandered more than a half a million dollars. She did it quick and she did it without his knowledge. Take a look. We own a bowling alley, but my wife Lori has given away about $530,000. And one of these COVID federal grant scams. The playbook's always the same. The scammers tell Lori she's eligible for all this money, but there's a catch. She has to pay them money to get money. She was very good with the books and money and... She handled all that. At oh, the yeah, she handled all that she, at our business. And, and she her, kept a grip on it. Absolutely. I never had to worry for a second. When did you first notice she was beginning to show changes in her ability for reasoning, recall, rationality? Probably about two years ago. These scammers, she gave vital information about herself, your banking information. And did she announce this to you like, hey, got some good news? Or how'd it come out? We were about at 300000 when I found out. Wow. Did it ever make sense that you would 
somehow send five hundred thousand dollars to get fifty? I don't know. She kept guaranteeing me I was going to get some money eventually. How's your memory? I have a hard time remembering a lot of things and remembering people's names. I have a family member who. What did she have? Your mom. Mm-hmm. She had dementia and Alzheimer's. So I'm concerned that I might be heading that direction. I've had to make a number of moves to protect us. Uh, I've taken away her cell phone. I've had to change the bank accounts. Well, I've recently filed for a conservatorship to take control of the finances. I feel like that's our only option. And so you have to realize this is the reality of our future. So it's not just protecting her from the scam, but protecting her from a cognitive set of skills that are diminishing and on the decline. Well, Mark, I'm, I'm glad to see you again. I, I'm sorry for your circumstance. This is Dr. Charles Hi. Sophie. Nice to meet and you. You um, I've uh, asked Dr. Sophie to join us because the situation hasn't gotten any better with no. her functioning, yeah, right? Correct. You know, strangely enough, I'm would probably tell you not to do a conservatorship. I think that could be very expensive, and I think you need to... I, I think you need real-world constraints that go even beyond that. Um, Dr. Sophie and Margaret, what do you all say about this? I mean, medically, where are you at with her? Um, just, uh, they've actually determined that it is dementia. Uh, the Alzheimer side of dementia is what they said. And Margaret... Uh, isn't a conservatorship going yeah. to be cumbersome? And Absolutely. So uh, a conservatorship is the remedy of absolute last resort. And uh, I think you need to think long and hard about erecting safeguards around the different accounts, uh, impose a voluntary credit freeze with the three large credit bureaus. Uh, but beyond that, you want to look at your own planning in the statistically unlikely event that she is the surviving spouse. Right. Your will from a million years ago leaves everything to her, and a court would be on that in three minutes. Right. So you want to think about creating a trust so everything you have goes into the trust for her soft landing and her lifetime benefit. Right. Well, some more thoughts from Ann Margaret when we come back. Are you concerned about some young children in your life? Do you fear their caregivers are making unsafe choices or even worse? If you know someone with questionable parenting behavior, I want to hear from you right away. Either log on to drphil.com and click be on the show. Margaret, uh, Mark is very concerned about his wife who uh, is suffering from uh, Alzheimer's. And Margaret, you mentioned that obviously he needs to modify the will and you know, what can you do if you've got a family member that has really gone off of their normal functioning, personality, problem solving uh, because of mental or emotional or neurological problems and they just simply can't be trusted? Well, we need to protect them as much as possible uh, from themselves, from uh, the outside world. I would just urge you to avoid the conservatorship route um, to the extent that you can, because not only will you have substantial legal fees, the court will appoint a separate attorney for your wife, substantial legal fees, and then the court appoints a third party called a court evaluator or a court examiner, depending upon what state we're in. So these are three sieves, and uh, you're going to blow through money like nobody's business. And nothing is to say that that is for her benefit. Right. And we don't have that money anymore anyway to give them, so. I think the takeaway is we avoid being in this situation by setting up advanced directives. You don't need an attorney to do a health care proxy, power of attorney. So we are appointing our own decision makers in the event uh, that we need some help later. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And maybe she can do that now. Yeah. Yep. Maybe, maybe you guys can take a few minutes to talk. Great. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Sophia.